is when they do this successfully, there are certain things that they don't get about the unattended, the message coming over the unattended channel. First, they don't notice when the unattended message switches in language from English to Bulgarian or something uh, like that. They don't notice when the unattended uh, 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 channel, the, the message switches from forward speech, like I'm talking right now, to backward speech, like you play a, 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 a tape uh, backwards. Uh, they did sometimes notice a switch between a male and a female voice, but they didn't notice, uh, they, they didn't notice these other things. And that led um, uh, Cherry and Broadbent and others to suggest that what happens is that the filter that is posed between the world outside and the limited capacity of uh, the, the processor basically filters out messages based on their physical properties, okay, uh, the, the various ways. So that attention serves as a kind of bottlenecker filter. That's where the filter idea comes from. And this selection is based on perceptual features. Uh, if I'm paying attention to you, I'm looking at you, you know, you know, your shirt and, and, and all of that, the tone of your voice and all of, the, all of that business. But that's all I'm doing is I'm, I, I'm kind of selected this object to pay attention to based on uh, various kinds of perceptual features. And semantic analysis, analysis for, for meaning, only occurs after some object of attention has passed through the filter, through the bottleneck. Early attentional selection based on physical features, later processing may be based on semantic uh, 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 kinds of features. That's the general idea behind the filter theory of attention. And it was historically quite important because uh, in the first place, this was the first time somebody tried to capture a cognitive process with a boxes and arrows diagram. And for those of you who have taken courses in cognitive psychology or cognitive science, you know that we love boxes and arrows diagrams, right? Uh, but Broadbent was the first one to do this. He was a, also an engineer, not just a psychologist. Engineers have been drawing boxes and arrows for untold, untold generations, uh, and now psychologists uh, can, uh, can do it too. Okay. What are the implications of the filter theory for consciousness? Okay. The first, and, uh, the, uh, the first uh, implication is that perceptual analysis of an object analysis of its physical features proceeds unconsciously in the sense that it occurs before attention is directed to the object, okay? If we're going to filter out things in the environment based on their perceptual features, you have to analyze those perceptual features before they're represented in the limited capacity information store, okay? So perceptual analysis, analysis of the physical features of objects, can, un can occur unconsciously or at least pre-attentively. The other implication of this filter theory is that semantic analysis, analysis of the meaning of the thing that, uh, that, that you're paying attention to, has to occur after you've paid attention to it. There's no analysis of meaning before you've paid attention uh, to the object, and it's from uh, this filter theory that we get this kind of basic vocabulary that as you proceed through the course and proceed through the Revan Suo book, uh, you'll see uh, appearing uh, uh, quite a bit. First, the identification of pre-attentive processing with pre-conscious processing. Pre-attentive processing occurs before you're conscious of something, okay? And uh, in, in these traditional theories, uh, pre-conscious processing is limited to perceptual analysis so-called perceptual analysis of the physical features of the stimulus. The other ident identity uh, that's implied by the filter theory is the identification of attention with consciousness, okay? Uh, once you've paid attention to, once you've selected something to pay attention to, then you become conscious of it, and once you're conscious of it, then you can process it semantically uh, for meaning. Those are the implications of the filter, uh, for the filter theory. Okay, and you can see this um, uh, kind of idea in what uh, another famous boxes and arrows diagram, which all of you are familiar with from your introductory courses, uh, if nothing else, 
the so-called multi-store model of memory uh, in which there are events in the world which pass through sensory registers and then by virtue of paying attention to some of those events as opposed to others, then the information gets uh, uh, recoded into short-term memory, can be maintained in short-term memory by virtue of rehearsal, or it can be encoded in long-term memory and then retrieved from long-term memory back into short-term memory. But the idea here is that sensory analysis occurs before attention, and then all the interesting processing is done after attention has been paid to somebody. Very, very, very powerful uh, the model, uh, which was very, very popular in the early days of the cognitive revolution, except for some problems, um, uh, which cropped up as people began to uh, do more and more variants on, uh, on Cherry's dichotic listening procedure. The first is uh, another one of Broadbent's and Cherry's colleagues, Neville Moray, uh, found out that if you played the person's name, the subject's own name over the unattended channel, they'd be distracted by that, okay? Even if it was said softly in a low tone of voice, they'd still pick up on it. The fact that people could be distracted by their own names appearing on the unattended channel seemed to show that something other than physical processing had to be going on, okay? You had to have, if you want, like a third ear or something, listening for things that are especially meaningful, like your own name, uh, and then you'd be distracted, you could be distracted by that. Uh, second, another British psychologist, now an American psychologist, Anne Treisman, who used to be here, uh, and then uh, went to uh, uh, Princeton, um, uh, the discovered that if you asked so a subject to shadow a message, say, coming over the left ear, and then you move that message to the right ear, what would happen very often is that subjects would shift from the left ear to the, 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 to the right ear. They would follow the message from one channel uh, to another. And again, the fact that people would do that, they didn't actually know that they were doing that. They'd say, oh, I thought I was listening to my left ear, but they weren't listening to the left ear because the message had been shifted to their right ear. Uh, the fact that people did that suggested that they could pick up the relationship between what is now coming over their right ear to what used to come over uh, their, uh, their left ear. That suggests, th those two findings taken together suggested that it was possible under some circumstances to engage in what is known as pre-attentive semantic analysis, okay? That at least under some circumstances, to some extent, some, some degree of semantic processing could occur before you paid attention uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the stimulus. Otherwise, you wouldn't be distracted by your own name. You wouldn't be able to follow uh, the message. That suggested, for the first time, that pre-attentive analysis, pre-conscious analysis, could go beyond the physical features of a, uh, of a stimulus and uh, engage with its semantic features or its meaning uh, as well, okay? which led Treisman to modify the uh, filter theory. Uh, Broadbent was Treisman's advisor. Uh, and uh, she suggested that, well, it's not really a filter, okay? Because the implication of a filter is that kind of everything is filtered out except the one thing that you want uh, to be filtered through. And uh, she, she argued that, in fact, what happens is that attention functions more like an attenuator or the volume control on something, where you don't filter things out entirely, you just tone down their volume, as it were, the psychological volume, uh, so that they do get through, but they just don't, um, they don't play a, a, much of a role uh, uh, in what's going on, unless you are particularly tuned to those particular kinds of things. So, for example, everybody, is, the, the, the implication is that everybody's tuned to somebody mentioning their name. If I go to a cocktail party and I'm engaged in some kind of conversation, and all of a sudden I hear somebody say, over, uh, over in the corner, yeah, I'm, th I'm looking for that, right? Uh, I want to know who's talking about me and what it, is, uh, what it is they're saying. So I'm kind of tuned to that thing. If somebody, if I'm, if I've en if I'm engaged in a conversation about, climate change, right? 
uh, and I overhear somebody talk, over in, in this part of the room talking about consciousness or hypnosis or something like that. I'm like, oh, you know, that's kind of interesting. You know. Oh, I wonder to, to, to see if I can pick up what's going on uh, over uh, over there because I'm interested in those topics in a way that I'm well I'm concerned about climate change but it's not you know the core of my existence um, uh, so yeah I'd probably be interested in what these in, in what these people are saying what Treisman did was to give us the first of what we might call cognitive theories of attention for Broadbent for Cherry. And for other people who, po who posited these, uh, these early filters, attention really is kind of a matter of bottom-up processing that takes stimuli, filters them out, and lets certain stimuli come in. It's data-driven processing. But Treisman argued that attention could be uh, a, a product of both so-called bottom-up data-driven processing and also top-down conceptually driven processing that I can go in and I can kind of be tuned to pick up about certain things that I'm very interested in, uh, even though somebody's talking in a low tone of voice, trying to prevent me from hearing what they're saying about me or whatever it is that, that, that's going on. Uh, I can tune myself so that I can pick up that kind of information. Uh, that's what made it a cognitive theory because the goals and the intentions of the observer played a role in what he or she paid attention to. It wasn't just a matter of a physical stimulus located in some, uh, in some particular spatial, uh, spatial location. Okay, so what we got from Treisman was this modified uh, the filter theory that suggested that at least some degree of semantic analysis could take place pre-attentively. Pre-attentive processing was not uh, confined to perceptual analyses of the physical properties of, uh, of stimuli. The next stage in the evolution of our theories of attention is called, uh, 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 is, is the development of a series of so-called late selection theories of attention. Uh, J. Anthony Deutsch uh, and uh, D Diana Deutsch at UC San Diego uh, had one of these. Um, uh, Don Norman, uh, also then at UC San Diego, had, uh, had, had another one. And what happens with, with these late selection theories um, is that th these late selection theories essentially abandon the idea of a filter entirely, okay? And what they suggest is that everything that gets pro everything that occurs in the, out in the environment gets processed simultaneously and in parallel and thoroughly, okay? So whereas the filter theory is an early selection theory, meaning that Selection is made at a very early perceptual stage of information processing, and then only later permits semantic processing. In these late stage theories, both perceptual processing and semantic processing occur at a very early stage of, late, uh, of, uh, of uh, information processing, and attention itself occurs later. That's why it's called a late selection theory. So that Everything gets processed all at once and in parallel. And then what we do is we pay attention to what is, this is Norman's phrase, pertinent to what's going on now. That is, basically pay attention to what is, uh, to what is meaningful. So attention now, in the filters, in, in the early, earlier filter theories, attention was required for selection of inputs. What do you, what's going to get in, get lodged in working memory? In these late selection theories, attention is relevant to the selection.